Welcome to the Mental Advantage Podcast. Whether you're an athlete trying to perform at your best when it counts the most, a coach or business leader trying to get more out of your team, or someone looking for more personal growth, this is the place for you. This podcast is your map to guide you to the right mindset, systems, and strategies you need to become the best version of yourself. Now, here are your hosts, John Cullen and Brandon Allen. All right, welcome to the Mental Advantage podcast. We've got with us tonight, Monty Lee. And Brandon, we have been really looking forward to this one for a while and actually have probably tried uh, at different times. This Mm -hmm. was something we tried at the beginning of the year, uh, or should say the beginning of baseball season this year. But then he got really busy with their season, of course. And so we had to to postpone it until after the season. But uh, we're so fortunate that he was able to take some time with us because you know and as i said to monty during the show he is somebody that we both have always looked on with such great admiration for the things he's been able to do the type of program builder he is i mean not only did he do some great stuff at our alma mater the college of charleston where he played um right after us actually monty played Mm -hmm. in 96 through 99 at the college of Charleston, but then later came back as the uh, head baseball coach there from 2009 to 2015. Um, And, you know, reached four NCAA tournaments, went to a super regional. They went out to Texas tech. So really uh, somebody that we've had great admiration for. So we were, we're glad to get him, you know, locked in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the listeners will hear, you know, why, uh, Monty is as ex- is as successful as he is. Um, you know, he has had some really good um, coaching success, both um, as a head coach and also for some of the uh, coaches that that he's been able to learn under. And and um, you know, there's no wonder why. Um, South Carolina has has kept him on board and and will be coaching with um you know future Hall of Famer Paul Maneri um uh these next few seasons. So um yeah, looking for really good things from Monty coming up and um certainly he's done a tremendous job with the uh, opportunities he's been given in the past. I think one of the things that stands out to me about him is you know and I think this goes back to his background. So Monty for the listeners was when he was coming through college, his goal uh, was to become a teacher and go, you know, did want to be that teacher coach route um, after college. And I think because he has that background in some education, um, you know, some of that education background, it's why one of the things that stands out to him, if you ask any coach uh, in the game, high school or college, uh, you know, when Monty is at one of these clinics or he's putting at a coach's clinic or he's uh, presenting something at ABCA or something like that, he does such a good job of delivering information, making it uh, understandable, digestible for the players. And that's a really key thing. I mean, you touched on it during the show about the portal and some of the challenges that brings uh, to coaches nowadays. But you've got to now, if I only have these players for a year or two, you got to be able to to coach them up, so to speak, in a very timely manner. Yeah, there's, you know, there's two things. And, you know, we it, the portal has changed some of what it, it hasn't diminished the they need to know you care before they care how much you know. It has not diminish that but like everything else in our society today it has accelerated that piece of it right that you have to foster that relationship and it was really interesting to hear Monty talk about how he does that and how he actually enjoys the the portal a little bit because of of what the accountability that that brings right um but 
so to your point, you, you have to foster these relationships, but you also have to pour into them pretty quickly now because the idea that you'll have them for two to three years is kind of out the window. But, you know, for some of our listeners that don't know, that's kind of how baseball has always been. Right. Right. Because no other sport in college athletics has um, the ability to take kids away from your roster through the draft that um, that baseball has. And, you know, the other thing, too, that that a lot of listeners may not understand is it's also the only sport where you can go out and recruit a kid and you can have a great recruiting class until that draft day shows up and they take five of your the 10 kids that you were going to sign. So I think I think you know there's some nuance to the game. I think Monty understands how to recruit and how to utilize the portal and I think it's why he is has been as successful as he has been. And I think also you talk about that relationship piece of it. You know, so Monty played at the College of Charleston, like I said. He was then an assistant coach at Spartanburg Methodist, a very successful program under mm-hmm. Tim Wallace down there in South Carolina. He was at South Carolina, of course, his first go around with Ray Tanner when they went to two College World Series and was the head coach at CFC, then the head coach at Clemson, and now is the associate head coach at South Carolina. But, and, and look, I mean, been very successful, you know, he's coached, uh, teams that have won championships in three different conferences, ACC, Colonial and SoCon. But here's what you made me think about there when you were talking about relationships is one of the all time leaders from a coaching perspective and developing relationships is Ralph Civitary, right? Like, who, who we both played for right. at the college of Charleston, who Monty played for at the college of Charleston. So, I I can't help but think that there, you know, when Monty was talking about all of the different influences um, that sure. Coach Tanner and Coach Wallace have had, um, I'm sure when it comes to the things he picked up from Coach Sibbs, it was that relationship. Because you talk about yeah. somebody who, I mean, we, we went on and on about it when he was on the, the show. Uh, you never doubted that that man cared about you as a player. There's no doubt about it. And, and you know, shout out to to coach sibs but um yeah i mean relationally there's probably not a better coach um to learn that kind of thing from yeah i mean there's there's some of those guys are x's and o's guys and and some are relational and some are a mix of both and you know i think that's the thing with monty is that you can tell he's got a really good mix of of that relational aspect but also you know wants to go out there and coach you hard and make sure that you're prepared for your game and um you know i again i think it's that type of of uh makeup and those mentors that he's had um that are going to continue to you know allow for him to succeed in whatever role he's at. Um, no question about it. Really good. And look, I mean, it, that's what the great ones do is they understand that each step along the way, they bloom where they're planted. They learn from the person that they are with at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even from their assistants and stuff. And Monty is definitely somebody who has learned from coaches and speaking of learning from coaches, there's plenty that the listeners are going to learn from Monty Lee. So get that, pen and paper ready because here is Monty Lee. All right. Well, there you heard it from the introduction. We got Monty Lee and man, you talk about a long time coming. Uh, We have been really looking forward to this conversation, Monty, and and can't thank you enough. I know this is a really crazy time for you guys. I know there's no such thing as an off season, especially when you're a college coach. Um, but you've got, you know, all these summer leagues that are still, you know, wrapping up, or I guess some of them are wrapping up, but we, we uh, really appreciate you taking some time out and joining us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, looking forward to talking to you guys. Well, I tell you what, you know, I was looking at this and I was thinking about, um, 
you know, when you start to look at your career and some of the the listeners heard there from the introduction, some of the places you had been. But when you think about it, I, I was like, man, you talk about hitting the lottery when you were just early in your coaching career. I mean, you talk about Tim Wallace at Spartanburg Methodist. You got Ray Tanner there at South Carolina. And even now, I mean, working with Paul Maneri, I mean, you, you've got two Hall of Famers right there. Um, and probably one of these days, a future Hall of Famer, right? Uh, but, you know, what have you been able to pick up from those guys? What were you able to pick up early on in your career that you've used to this day? Oh, goodness. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot. Um, I was very, very fortunate to start out my career with Tim Wallace, who's a Hall of Famer, has won north of a thousand games in junior college baseball. They're now transitioning to NAIA. But, you know, Tim, probably the biggest thing that stood out to me about Tim working for Tim for two years is just how clearly he could communicate baseball fundamentals. Um, he is so well-spoken, uh, so articulate, so intelligent, um, and just having to coach everything at the junior college level. I mean, he literally coached everything. He had years at Spartanburg Methodist where he was the only coach on staff. And, and literally having to run a pitching staff, having to run the outfielders, infielders, catchers, hitting, base running, like do it all, fix the field, uh, you know, the scheduling, the meals, the travel, the hotels, just everything. The guy literally had to do everything by himself. And, you know, I used to ask Coach Wallace, hey, what can I do for you? How can I help you? He's like, dude, I'm just glad you're here. I just need somebody <laughs> to take some of take some of the workload off of me. I'm just glad to have some help. Yeah. Um, but he was such a good communicator. Um, and a lot of the things that that I taught for the 14 years that I was a head coach in terms of, you know, the team defensive fundamentals, your cuts and relays, fly ball communication, first and thirds, bunt Ds, uh, batting practice routines, infield routines. A lot of the things that I did at CFC, I learned from Tim. Wow. Uh, just because, again, like he had to organize his practices where they were efficient and effective and uh, with just him running them. Uh, so, um, so I, I took a lot from him about being able to put practice templates together and running efficient and effective practices uh, from Coach Wallace. Um, you know, moving on to, you know, Coach Tanner. Uh, Coach Tanner, the most competitive human being I've ever been around by far. Uh, just the intensity, the toughness, the old school, hard nosed, um, just. He was a winner. Like you could just from day one being around him, just understanding the sense of urgency in which he did everything, the intensity in which he coached, the toughness of the players like South Carolina during his tenure. Those teams were just so, so freaking tough. Yeah. Um, and they really would take on his personality. He was he treated his coach as like gold. Um, I learned a lot about um, delegating from Coach Tanner. Coach Tanner basically told me within about five minutes, like what my role was on the staff. Wow. He said, look, you're, you're, you're the hitting coach. You're the outfield coach. You're the base running coach. And uh, that's it. You do all that. That's it. Um, we're not, we don't need to meet. We don't need to discuss it a whole lot. I trust you. You're, you, you do the hitting, you do the outfield play, you do the base running. And I said, Coach, is there any rules that I need to know about as far as things that you like? He said, yes, there's two things you need to know. Number one, you get to the office before I get there, and you don't leave until after I leave. And if I call you, you answer. Oh, that's that's it. And so that stuck with me so, like, just like from being a young guy after coming from working for Tim. Right. Just, again, like the simplicity of Coach Tanner really, really helped me as a young coach. It was like, if that guy calls, you better answer and uh, and get there before he gets there and don't leave until after he leaves and you know what your responsibilities are. And um, he gave me a lot of independence as a young coach to coach the hitters the way that I wanted to coach them, to run the outfielders, the base running. And he he wasn't a micromanager. He trusted his coaches. He believed in his coaches. 
Um, and I absolutely loved working for him, would run through a brick wall for him, just like his players would, because he just gave you so much, uh, responsibility without micromanaging you or necessarily telling you how to do things. I, I really learned how to develop my own style as a coach through him, but I got a chance to watch a guy who like was as, again, just as competitive and as tough a guy as, uh, as 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 you'll find in a dugout and um and uh, I owe him obviously a tremendous amount um you know coach Maneri I have been with coach Maneri now um you know for this summer so I haven't had a chance to be on the field with coach Maneri yet one of the things that has just just I've been so impressed with coach Maneri is his organization like his mm-hmm. organization is just through the roof like we literally are putting together all of our meetings for next week when the guys come back and I've read every email that he sends out to the players. We went through all the team rules, the procedures, the way we do things. I don't know if I've ever been around anyone who is just so, uh, again, just so organized to the finest details about what the locker room should look like, how you wear the uniform, how you enter and exit the building just the expectations of just how we do everything. Coach Maneri is a guy that, again, is just super, super organized, um, understands what it takes to to win at a high level. He's the winningest Division One baseball coach in college baseball as far as active baseball coaches. So, uh, you know, his, his resume is just so, so impressive. Um, and I see a lot of Coach Tanner in Coach Maneri. Um, you know, those, again, just just how organized they are, how efficient they are. They're old school. Uh, very disciplined, uh, expect a lot out of the players, expect a lot out of their staffs, but also treat you like gold. Uh, so, um, it's been, it's been an, an awesome, again, just journey for me, uh, overall between my time as an assistant coach for three different coaches and, and coach Kingston. I learned a lot from Mark Kingston. Mark was tremendous to me for two years. Um, uh, you know, a, a completely different style. Mark, uh, you know, again, gave me full autonomy to run the offense, to coach the hitters, gave me, you know, so much support um, and uh, was more of a player's coach, uh, very laid back, uh, but allowed the players to be themselves, gave them a lot of freedom to be themselves and play the game the, the way that they wanted to play. And um, so I've learned a lot from all the guys that I've that I've worked for and and appreciate each and every one of them so much. It's really interesting to hear that, Monica, because like, you look at at where some of those guys maybe came from and their coaching tree. And I know with um, we've had Dr. Brett McCabe on before who played for Skip down at LSU. And, Mm -hmm. you know, his big thing was, I mean, you talk about detail and being organized, you know, he was, Mm -hmm. he was, he would go to the concession stand and taste the popcorn to see if it was cooked right. Like it was like, it's this, how you do one thing is how you do everything kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's interesting to see how that trickles down um, to the coaches that are out there today. But, you know, a lot of coaches are having to, um, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a, a new frontier for all of y'all, right? I mean, you've got the portal that you're having to deal with. You've got NIL stuff. So you've got all this old school coaching, habits and and ways to organize and run things to be successful but then you throw in this other stuff that you guys are having to deal with are you is it is it starting to solidify a little bit for y'all in terms of how do you manage this or is it still kind of you know sticking a foot in the in the water to see see what's going on well i think it's it's I think when it comes to NIL and when it comes to the transfer portal and and the recruiting philosophies of Power Five baseball in this day and age, it's 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 ever evolving and changing a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there's to me there's there's two things that kind of stand out to me going through this process and seeing it change so rapidly over the last couple of years. Uh, number one, because of the transfer portal, you have to be you have to be very accountable for your relationships with the players. Like they, I like it from the standpoint of like you, you know, the players today can fact check you, Mm -hmm. right? Like they can fact check you. Like if you're going over, like as a hitting coach, I love it because it's like, 
the information that I have to give the players, it has to be accurate because they can go on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. They have their own hitting coaches from back home. They work with several different people. They can fact check you on everything that you're giving them. So like from an accountability standpoint, like you better be on point when it comes to communicating with a player in this day and age, because they have access to so much information. Whereas, you know, back when we played, it's like whatever the coach said was gold. That was gospel. Right. Like you had to kind of do exactly what the coach said, because it wasn't like we could go on YouTube and look up, you know, hitting philosophy, pitching philosophy, whatever the case may be. It's like whatever that coach said, you had to listen, you had to apply, and you had to do it his way. And kids today can they can look at the information and say, this guy knows what he's talking about or this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So I think from an accountability standpoint of your relationship, kids today are very relationship driven. Um, and they, and again, they can explore and learn and, and find information uh, very, very easily. So I think an accountability, the accountability part today is bigger than ever for the coaches when it comes to, again, the relationships and what you're teaching them um, because they care about relationships and they care about player development yeah. more than ever. Um, and I also think that with the transfer portal and with NIL, um, they're learning that this is a business, that this is a business and that we're, you're in the, like, if you look, you're, you're getting paid now, you're getting money and there's taxes involved and there's, there's all of this stuff that you got to manage. But on the other side of that, it's like, look, if, if your name image and likeness is out there and you think it's all great and wonderful, but as we all know, when it comes to when money gets involved, production and yeah. winning are put at a high premium. Uh, yeah. So it's all about, it's all about now. It's like, Hey, you want to understand what it's like to be in a business where results really, really matter, start getting money involved. Uh, so there's just things that, that the kids today, I think are getting ready to learn about, Hey, yeah. There's a lot of money going on in college baseball. There's a high sense of urgency for you to perform and for us to perform because people are investing in college baseball at such a high level. Well, then, uh, so um, it's a, it's an also, interesting dynamic for sure. No, and I, I think it's a great point, Monty. And it also is one of those things that I think also adds another challenge to you guys in the coaching profession because that – need for now and that sense of urgency you talk about it is also that like you know generation y and the y stands for why is this hap not happening right now right like they want this instant gratification um and sometimes that can be challenging because i know and i've heard you talk about this on other podcasts uh is you know your commitment to the process and your commitment to stacking days as you've talked about it before mm -hmm. and this idea of you know how can i make the next best decision how can i do the next best action that's going to get me closer to this goal that i have these things that i'm wanting to attain now so how mm -hmm. challenging is that as a coach to try and blend those two things, right? This player who wants this all to happen right now and maybe feels this added pressure because of NIL to make it happen mm -hmm. right now. But you know, as a coach, this takes time. Like you have mm -hmm. to put some days together in that compound effect to be able to really achieve these things you're trying to achieve. Right. I think it's, I think it's kind of in, in my, in my humble opinion, I think with the transfer portal and with incoming freshmen, I still think that the incoming freshman model of progressing slowly but surely and stacking mm -hmm. those days upon those days and, 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 you know, gaining, you know, two to three pounds of muscle a month and, you know, gaining a little more bat speed and a little more foot speed and a little more velocity and having a little more of an understanding just over time, just getting a little bit better day in and day out. I still think is 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 the model that's going to that's going to yield the most sustainable success yeah. because you still have to be able to run a program and a program is built on continuity and consistency and yeah. you get that when you bring them in as freshmen and you build them up right um so and that being said just understand that when it comes to the transfer portal and when those guys come in out of the portal this is what I call them. You're a hired assassin, man. That's it. Mm -hmm. Like you're a hired assassin. You are coming in. I don't care. I don't care how you hit the target. 
but here's the gun, hit the target. You're yeah. a hired assassin. That's that's what it is. And that being said, though, even with the portal guys, sometimes there's a reason that they go into the portal. They're looking for something different, whether it's, you know, whether it's I was a really good player at a mid-major and I want to challenge myself at the power five level, or I was at another power five and maybe I'm not playing the position or in the role that that I want. And this is an opportunity for me to seek another role. Um, I think that, you know, you're again, the, the expectation when you do make that transition uh, or even the guys that are that went into the portal that were in our program that maybe didn't play a lot and they wanted to go down a level to play, which is what I think the portal really should be utilized for. Um, they're still they're expected. Hey, man, you came from South Carolina. You're now at a mid major. You're a hired assassin. You right. you gotta you gotta come in and perform, dude. Like we brought you in to be a dude. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, again, it's it's a it's a balance. But at the end of the day, if you look at just in my two years at South Carolina that I've been here, again, this is just purely observation. Uh, Braylon Wimmer, a uh, tremendous player in our program, is now killing it in professional baseball, homegrown player. Uh, Cole Messina, third round pick, all SEC, homegrown player. Mm-hmm. Ethan Petrie, MVP of the Cape Cod League, homegrown player. Um, so I still think that you build that continuity, that consistency of a program through the homegrown players that you bring in. I think there's just this misconception by people out there that, well, you know, the, the poor incoming high school guy, like they're not, right. they're not going to be able to play and you're going to recruit over them and this, that, and the other. That's simply not the case. The best players are still going to be your homegrown guys. Your transfer portal guys, they're coming in and they have a job to do. And that is to help you win and win immediately. And hopefully they come in and give themselves an opportunity to move on to the next level by playing in a Power 5 program like a South Carolina and producing. Yeah, that's awesome. So one of the things, Monty, that really I'm intrigued about as it pertains to some some of what you just said is how do you how do you manage those expectations you know one of the things that John and I talk about on the podcast is you know we we didn't have we didn't have any of this stuff that resources that kids have today right i mean mm-hmm. didn't have the weight rooms that they have we didn't have the science and the tech that they have e- even mm-hmm. even to the point of like the the bat tech and the even the fabric mm-hmm. tech, right? I mean, all the stuff that mm, you're squeezing the most out of out of the athlete that you can. But then you've got these expectations, like you said. And one of the things that we talk to some of the clinicians about is they're seeing more and more anxiety, more and more pressure, more and more just. And these are these are not because of nil and because of of having to perform. This is just. This is just some of the youth that's coming up, right? So how do you guys, or is there a process that you guys try to leverage uh, for the players when it comes to managing those expectations and and mm. helping them kind of get out there, clear mind, clear conscience, and being able to let it rip? Well, it's a good, I mean, that's a good question. I think that, you know, <clears throat> that a lot of that comes down to the mental game right. and how much you implement into the mental game and how you get them to manage their anxiety. Another big part of that too, though, is you have to be, you, you have to get the players to understand what success looks like. Mm-hmm. Like, what does that look like? And it doesn't always necessarily mean I went two for four or that I went six innings and, you know, only gave up one run on the mound. You know, you you still have to f- have some process goals for your players in place to to get them to understand what the success look like. And also in this day and age, too, again, like you and I heard this the other day and I thought it was really, really good. It's like y- you have to be willing to celebrate some of their failures, too. Like you have to be able to look at their failures and and laugh about it a little bit and get them to understand that, dude, you're playing the hardest game there is like. Baseball is a hard game built for hard men. Yeah. I mean, you have to be mentally tough and you have to be a little bit hard between the ears to be able to play this game because again, there's so much failure involved. So you got to celebrate, 
your failures a little bit. Like, dude, you were zero for four with three punch outs. Like, you were terrible today. Right. Like, hey, but the the great thing about this game is, dude, you get to come out tomorrow and do it again. And like, yeah. how about you? How about you swinging at the slider three feet off the plate to two <laughs> count? Like, what in the hell are you doing, man? You know, like you have to be willing to laugh a little bit and enjoy just just what every baseball player has to deal with. It's just. You're going to screw up. You're going to fail. So if you're going to fail, you need fail miserably and learn from it and understand it. Every player goes through this, man. It's just part of it. And that's what I try to do. Like if there's anything that I try to do as a mentor to our players, it's just getting them to understand it. Dude, it's okay to swing and miss. It's okay to make an error. It's okay to fail. Like you guys, the thing about people can say whatever they want about kids in this day and age. Kids in this day and age work harder than ever before. Yeah. Like they do. Like they are so committed to being good. They hit more than ever. They practice harder than ever. They take care of their bodies. Like, you know, kids, you know, they, they stay hydrated. They eat cleaner. They, they sleep better. They prioritize uh, performance so much. I think it causes them anxiety. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I think the anxieties come uh, from they put so much of a premium on doing things to optimize their performance that they don't allow themselves just to be kids. Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, I think that, you know, back when we played, it's like, we didn't know any better. So, uh, you know, it was just like, you just, you just kind of had to deal with it. And, and there was nobody there to talk to you about it. And there was no mental game. There was, it was just like, I think one of the things that we benefited from, and I try to tell kids in this day and age, you know, is is self-motivation and self-exploration were a big part of of our generation. Yeah. It's like I didn't know how to work on my swing. I just went to the cage with my buddies and we hit a lot. Right. And we talked hitting and we started to understand things about hitting just from communicating with each other. It was more of a self exploration and you had to be super self motivated to do that. Um, but th- those are the things that I think in this day and age, because kids can find the answers when they can't find the answer to something, they freak out. They don't right. know how to deal with. I don't know the answer to this. I can't find it. You know, I can't Google this. Right. I can't, I can't find the answer to this. Like, how do I manage this? How do I deal with this? And, um, you know, and that's again just the difference in the generations. I don't know if any of that makes sense, but no, hundred uh, percent. It's it's, it's the uh, imagination it's, or a lack of imagination. Yeah. To your point, yeah. like we had to figure right. out wherever that whatever was missing, you had mm-hmm. to figure that out. And um there was just different ways that we could do that. You know, we I, I shouldn't speak for all of us, but like, you know, h- how many guys did you know that could emulate Fred McGriff or right. Bagwell right. swing or I mean, because like right. you could watch those guys and be like, well, hell, that's pretty successful. Let me give that a rip when I'm in the middle of a right. Right. And kids right. just don't do that now. Like there's no very little no. emulation that goes on, very little imagination. So I mean, I think that's a it's a great answer. I I you're right though. They they are they are they've hit this law or wall of diminishing return in terms of how much more juice can they squeeze out of mm-hmm. their bodies and their performance at this point. It's, it's, it's hard because the science is there to say, this mm-hmm. is what you got to do. And these, this is, you follow this process. To your it's point. also, yeah. I think, uh, important in money, you kind of touched on this, but it's important that, to give yourself some grace and to be able to say like Mm -hmm. with that failure, I need to be able to flush it. I need to be able to move on to the next pitch. And we talk about this as, you know, from a mental performance standpoint, from a coaching perspective, we always hear, you know, coaches talking about playing the game pitch to pitch, but how truly critical it is that if I am in the box and that, you know, umpire just called a bad, you know, made a bad call in my opinion that I learned to flush that pitch and move on to the next one. It's that next pitch velocity. Like how quickly can I go to the next pitch? Because if I'm going to sit in that for the next three or four pitches as a hitter, I've now lost three or four more pitches and I'm not focused on this at bat or, and just how critical it is, even as a player, if you make an error or something like that. And I think it's really, um, 
it's interesting because, you know, I had this conversation with a guy the other day, we were talking about the NBA players playing in the Olympics and basketball. And he was like, well, how hard could it be for them to win the gold? And I said, I'll be honest with you. I said, after 20 some years of coaching and more than that, really, I said, and um, as a player and as a coach, when I look back at some of the most successful teams that I've been on, they weren't the most talented teams. It's not like mm -hmm. talent, this idea that, oh, the Carpenter's only as good as his tools and great players make great coaches. That's not always the case when it comes to, you know, the most successful teams are the ones that have talent, but they also have that ability to be player led. They have that ability to move on to the next pitch and do all those things we're talking about from a mental game standpoint as well. Yeah, no, I would agree. I mean, we, we call it toughness over talent. I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, it's just, it's just, and, and, but being able, again, like, I think you have to define that, like, cause kids today, like, if you talk about, like, you got to be tough, they think that means aggressive and mean and fierce. And like, that's not what it means. Like being tough is simply your ability to, like you just said, like, if I take a good pitch or I swing in a bad pitch or I make an error or something just doesn't work the way that I need it to work on that pitch, right? I just, I fail on that rep. It's your ability to immediately be able to flush it and move on to the next rep and not hold on to that negativity in your mind and allow that frustration to boil over. That's true mental toughness. Yeah. Uh, so it's just being able to d define that toughness really is playing pitch to pitch. And, and ultimately, like the teams that win at a high level, they just simply do a better job of playing 150 pitches than the other team. That's really yeah. what it boils down to. And the hardest part of the game uh, mentally is when you get to where all the magic happens. Um, you know, when you think about it, it, it's like the first six innings of the game. Well, I guess in this day and age, maybe the first four, because, you know, we can't get through six innings with a starting pitcher anymore. <laughs> but if you, if you, if you just look at like when starting pitchers come out of the game, right after the fifth inning or the sixth inning up until that point, it's pretty much just straight up baseball. Yeah, it's just straight up baseball. It's it's my offense versus your offense, my starting pitcher versus your starting pitcher, right? But then, like once the relievers start to come in, if the game is like a in, in in balance and it's a close game, that's where all the magic happens. That's where the pressure at bats, the high leverage at bats happen. That's where you have the situational hit. That's where you have the situational pitch. That's where you got to make a big play. Well, ultimately, that's typically about two and a half hours, two two and a half hours into the game. So the mental focus has to be really, really high two hours into the game when it's needed the most. Yeah. That's what makes baseball special. So when you talk about mental toughness, it's like we talk about it in practice. It's like, guys, we're two hours into practice. Now I know that you guys are 30 minutes, an hour away from being done. This is when you we need you to be focused the most. Because ultimately, like that mental fatigue that starts to hit, you know, two hours into a practice, two and a half hours into a practice, what's it going to be like in the season? Can you maintain, you know, that again, being mentally sharp and just playing one pitch at a time, you got to you got to practice the same way. Like we have to finish that last 30 minutes of practice needs to be better than the first 30 minutes of practice. That takes a lot of mental toughness to be able to do that because there's so much, again, physical and mental fatigue over the course of the game or over the course of practice. So, um, I love again, that. it's a toughness. It's just it's simply a mental toughness game. It just is. It's just can I compete one rep at a time? In practice, can I compete one pitch at a time in the game? And can I do that over and over and over again? And if I can, when the game is over or practice is over, it should be as mentally exhausting as it was physically exhausting. Um, I love so that you I think call ultimately, you know, yeah, I, I, love, just think, I, love, I just think I that's that a you, good way to look at it. Yeah, no, I, I do. I love that you call that out because it's one of those things that, that, now the kids understand, the players understand that they need to be intentional about this. This is one of the things among many things that I've uh, really admired about you and your coaching career is, is number one, just being such a great teacher to somebody who connects with players, that competitiveness. I was thinking when you were talking about Coach Tanner that 
I, I've always thought your programs always had a certain level of toughness and grit to them. So I can only imagine what it was like. There's a reason that when you and Coach Tanner were together, that was a pretty, uh, pretty powerful uh, duo there. But, you know, I've stolen a lot from you over the years. Uh, one of the things, and I love this because you were just talking about this a minute ago about like being able to laugh at failure or what I would even say is giving your kids permission to fail. Uh, and mm-hmm. sometimes you can do that intentionally through like one of the things that I always think about that I stole from you many years ago um, was when you were still with coach Tanner, you all had such intentionality that you had up in the dugout, you had some rules of hitting some, some principles that you wanted you on to, that, that what you would consider a good at bad, a good approach to it. Number one was be determined to get your hacks, right? That was number Mm -hmm. one. Number two was, and I love this. This is what I'm talking about here when about giving them permission to fail is number two was if you follow rule number one, you may swing at some bad pitches that if you're up there Mm -hmm. with the mentality of yes, 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 no, then understand that sometimes you're going to go ahead and pull the trigger and Gosh, that's such a powerful thing for coaches. And I, and we, I know we have a lot of coaches that listen to this show, but it's, it's powerful for them to understand. Sometimes you have to give them permission through something like those rules of hitting to say, Hey, if we're wanting you to be aggressive, we can't then come and turn around and, and get on you because you were too aggressive. If that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. Again, you can't have it both ways. I mean, yeah. again, I think, I think the first thing that we, we try to get our guys to understand is that nothing. Yes. There's, there's offense and there's defense in this game, but nothing is defensive. Like no part of this game is defensive. It's like, you don't swing the bat defensively. I understand two strike approach. I get that. But like, even in a two strike approach, like I'm not trying to be defensive and just put the ball in play. I just shift my focus. I shift my focus to the outer half. I'm letting the ball get a little bit deeper. I cut the field in half and I'm looking to hit the ball to the opposite field. And I'm still looking to hit the ball hard. Like I'm still, I'm still taking my, I'm still taking my best swing just with a different focus, a different field of play. I shift, I shift my eyes, I shift my contact back. Um, So it's, it's, it's literally just, I just change my approach, but I'm still offensive. And like, and then, you know, I mean, just look at the game today, like who doesn't swing and miss? Right. I mean, who doesn't swing and miss? I mean, yeah. there's just very few players. There's no, there's very few. Is there anybody in baseball, really, I can name like two or three that are like Wade Boggs and Tony Gwynn? Tony Gwynn. Like, there's right. just not that, there's not that type of player. And people say, well, why aren't there those types of players? It's because guys are throwing 100 miles an hour with 90 mile an hour sliders. Yeah. Like, right. Tony Gwynn and Wade Boggs weren't facing those kind of arms. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's, do you think guys want to strike out? Like, no, right. they don't want to strike out. It's not like they're trying to swing and miss. They just are because pitching is so good in this day and age. Stuff is so good. So it's okay to swing and miss. What I don't, what, what, what failing to me is in a game is when you decel your swing. We call it like you, there's, there's three, there's, there's only, there's only three things you cannot do. And, and I just wrote this down for our first team meeting with our hitters next week. There's three don'ts for me. Everything else is a do. Don't desell your swing. Always take your best swing because every hitter swings and misses. Number two, don't check your swing and put the ball in play because that means you're not committed to being on time to his best fastball. Anytime I check my swing and tap the ball, I'm late and I'm indecisive on the pitch. I would rather you swing through a pitch with full conviction and being on time to his best heater than you making a late decision and a decision that you're not convicted with. So don't check your swing and tap the ball. Just take your best swing on time to the best heater. If you swing and miss, so be it. I, I don't care. And the last one is, is don't ever let the pitcher move your feet. Mm-hmm. Like if, if, if the ball's going to hit you, you get to go to first base. There's a toughness level involved with being able to take a pitch and, and let it hit you and go to first base. So that's a toughness factor for me. Again, you know, and, and when you send a message as like, guys, we're going to stay on pitches. We're going to take our best swing. We're going to be on time and we're going to do everything that we can freaking do to get on base, man. Like get on freaking base. It's a grind. It's a hard game. 
game built for hard men. Get on base. Pass the baton on to the next guy. And if you do those things, you can play for me. Right. Take your best swing every time. Be on time to his best fastball. And find any means necessary to get on base. And, um, you know, and, and just give them the freedom to understand that. And um, and, it, and we don't talk about putting the ball in play. Just put the ball in play. I swear. Every time I go to a little league game and I hear just <laughs> yeah. put the ball in play, it's like, well, what does the kid do? They 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 swing from their ear and they yeah. just try to they just try touch to it. touch the ball. And it's like, yeah. man, how about get your hands back over your back foot and let it freaking eat? Let it rip. Like let it eat, man. Like have so what, fun. Like I used to tell the kids, swing hard in case you hit it. Right. Yeah, for uh, sure. You know, yeah, I mean, it's, sure. it, it, you just reminded me, Monty, with your, the, the feet about moving the feet. That was one of my, uh, one of the Monty Lee isms that I wrote down years ago was, uh, compete on every pitch and be great where your feet are. That was, That's that right. was, uh, yeah. that was kind of your old principles there for a while. I, how yep. you talk about competition. I just, I just said that, you know, when I think of Monty Lee coached teams, there's a certain level of grit, certain level of resilience and, and tenacity that comes with that. How do you find, how do you, I should say, define a good competitor, a great competitor? Like what, what are you looking for with that? Well, I think the first thing about a great competitor is that they're more selfless than they are selfish. So I think that competitive and, and, and when you look at when you look at people who are selfless, who always put the team first, um, people who are wired like that and built like that, they had to be taught that. Mm. OK, because we are all inherently born selfish. And if you don't believe that, just watch little kids when it comes to playing with toys, they don't share. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Like you have to teach, you have to teach a kid how to share. You don't have to teach them how to keep everything that they own to themselves. Right. 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 Yeah. And it's just that simple. So it has to be taught. So being, so being willing to share, being willing to put the team first or your brothers and sisters first, or to be selfless, to put something ahead of yourself has to be taught. Okay. So the the best players, the ones that are the most competitive, put the team first. They are the most coachable. Okay. That's the first thing. Um, that that would be like that's the very first thing that we talk about with our with when it comes to competing, is you got to be selfless. You get you got to put the team first. And you have to look at this game as what can I do to help my team win? You talk about being great where your feet are. Like we talk about being great where our feet are. What does that mean? What that means is is if I'm in the dugout, I'm the best teammate I can be for my for for my team. The guys that are at the plate, the guy that's on the mound, you're always in the game, watching the game, cheering your teammates on. If I'm running the bases, I'm gonna run to I'm gonna run to I'm the best base runner on the field. Wherever my feet are, I'm going to be great at it. If I'm a defender, I'm the best defender on the field. If I'm in the box, I'm the best competitor in the batter's box of anybody here. If I'm on the mound, same thing. So wherever my feet are, I'm going to be great at it. And that just simply means just putting your team first. And if you do that, if you've put in the work and practice to, to, you know, to get your swing right, to get your approach right, to get your mechanics right, if you've worked incredibly hard in practice, you should just be able to go out there pressure free, play the game and just compete to help your team win. Um, you know, that's been my belief. I think that coaches typically have it backwards. We're typically way too serious in the game and too relaxed in practice. Mm-hmm. I think that practice is where you should be serious. You should freaking get after it. That's where hard coaching happens. And then when it comes game time, you should be loose. You should have fun. You should just go compete. Uh, so, um, you know, and those are the things that we try to preach to our guys is that practice is mine. Game is yours. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, maybe, I thought maybe. you, uh, you made a great observation in one of the, things some of my research about this idea of players who are good at it versus the player who loves it yeah Mm -hmm. and and unpack that if you if you would a little bit because Mm -hmm. i thought this was really interesting from a coaching perspective and we have a lot of business leaders on on Mm -hmm. you know that listen to show as well is like you know just because somebody is highly successful or is very Mm -hmm. good at a particular skill 
doesn't always mean that they've got the the want to right or or you know mm. or they love mm. what they're doing. Yeah, I mean there, there's there's players that play the game because they're good at it, and then there's players that play the game because they love to play. And I think the question you have to ask yourself, which one are you? Like we we work with high level athletes that are all pretty dang good at playing the game, but do you play the game because you're good at it? Or do you take the talent and the skill that you have and play the game because you love to play the game? Mm -hmm. And there's guys, I'm telling you, like, I know you guys played with them. I played with them. I've coached them. I've had a lot of guys that were really good freaking players that did not like playing it. Yeah. They didn't really like, they didn't really like, they didn't really like playing baseball. And I think it's because the game beats you up so much that some guys are like, man, I just, I play it because I'm really good at it and I've played it my whole life and I'm, and it's all I really know how to do, but man, I don't really, I don't really love this game. Right. Um, so and I think you see it a lot money at the college level. I've talked about this before on the show where these players who don't really love it, but they've been playing all their lives. They've been playing in travel ball. They've been playing in, in high school, every single team you can think of. It's almost baseball 365, but mm -hmm. They get to college and they left their engine at home. Their engine was mm -hmm. their dad, right? Their engine was mm -hmm. the, the dad who was saying, hey, let's go out. You should be getting some swings in. You should be getting some ground balls or whatever. And now all of a sudden you guys are getting them on campus. And it's pretty tough thing when you realize pretty early in fall ball, this kid just don't. I mean, he he, he he's here, but he left that engine at home. You know, that, yeah. that motor is yeah. not with him. Well, I think a lot of that comes from, you know, quite honestly, I think that comparison is a killer. I think that when, when a player gets on campus, I think when they start looking around and trying to compare themselves to others, I think that that kills you a little bit. I think that what you what you have to do, and again, one of the things that we, we try to talk about to our guys is that y you as an individual needs to be celebrated. Like when you come into the program, we're going to have team concepts and there's going to be rules that you have to follow. And we all have to look look alike with how we wear the uniform. And there's certain things that you're just going to have to do as a team. But we want you to do it in your own style and in your own way. Like you still have to be an individual. I love recruiting a player who tells me, Coach, I don't care if you have three shortstops. Like I'm going to come in and I'm going to be the dude. I don't care how many guys you got in my position. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to be the dude. And then you get some guys, well, how many short sets do you have? How many short sets do you have coming in? How many do you have committed in my class? How many guys are you bringing in in my class? And they start worrying about everybody else but themselves. And you start to think there's some chinks in the armor here. Right. You know, at the at the end of the day, the guys that, that's, that bet on themselves, are the ones that are going to win the most games for you. Yeah. Uh, so I think that when you, what you're talking about is is simply is that player is that player betting on himself when he gets there that all the things that I've done up until this point have gotten me here and I'm I'm going to go win a job I'm going to go earn a job and I'm going to it doesn't matter how many guys I have in my position or it doesn't matter that they have a senior there or whatever I'm going to find a way to get on the field and compete and help this team win because I believe in myself and I believe in my ability and I don't care what these other guys think. Yeah. Um and uh, that's a tough trait to find. Um but uh when you find it you know it. I mean yeah. you know it. So I had uh an opportunity to work at clinic with Turtle Thomas years ago and Turtle uh told this story about the the rock the jelly bean and the marshmallow oh yeah said, yeah, yeah you know yeah it is so great because he said you those jelly beans will fool you for a while they're the ones that that you think are hard uh because mm -hmm. they're presenting themselves as hard but they're really soft on the inside when it comes down to it and you you get that um we talked earlier about process a little bit and i know you know that's one of the things that <laughs> I think is is so important is, is number one is how, I guess the question when I start thinking about process that I was wanting to ask you, because you've been really successful as a coach. And then there's times where you've probably um, thought to yourself, is the process that I'm using now 
maybe the formula that I had that was successful at one point, like, when do you know that you need to change that? When do you know that that is something that mm-hmm. you need to reevaluate or, uh, maybe it's just that, you know, it's like the old thing about the goal stays the same. It's just the, the, the plan, the path to get to the goal is what you'll have to change. Yeah. I think that one of the things, um, uh, that I've always, I've always tried to look at year in, year out, like what went well, what didn't go well, what were our focuses this year versus, uh, other years. And, and one of the things that I keep coming back to is I always felt like the more that I tried to implement and the more that I tried to do, the less I got. Um, I, I always felt like when I only had a handful of principles in uh, in 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 practice formats and cage routines and just things that we emphasized, I'll, it, it, when you can when you can just focus on four or five things that you want to be really good at. Um, you tend to be you tend to be a lot better off, in my opinion. Uh, so I try to keep things very simple now because I have fallen victim of trying to work on having like six different offensive fundamentals for that day, and you know trying to cover trying to cover all of these different fundamentals. And when you try to cram a lot of different things into one day or into one week, I think sometimes you just wind up getting nothing. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say that if there's anything that I've learned over the years, I think that that literally just I saw this online one time and I thought it was really cool. It basically like had um, like nine different hitting tools. It was like a hitting Instagram thing. <laughs> and like it was like a heavy bat a pitching machine, um, uh, like all these different things. And you could only pick two. It's like you can only pick two things for like one year. What would you pick out of these items? And I found that to be really, really cool because I said, you know what, if if I only had this and this, I feel like I could I could, you know, run through a cage routine with hitters and and be pretty efficient. So I started to think about coaching like that. Like if I could only cover three or four things, what would they be? And I feel like I have it down to the way that 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 I like it and that it's simple and that it's pretty effective just because of its simplicity. Yeah, you know, you made me uh, think about do simple better, right? That mentality is, I when I was in Virginia, I used to work a lot of uh, summer camps for uh, Brian O'Connor at the University of Virginia. And I remember we were working mm-hmm. a, um, a coach's clinic or something one time, and we were going over bunt defenses, and everybody's gone, and they're sharing all their ideas on how they're doing this and all the different things. And uh, somebody asked him, well, Oak, what, what's your philosophy on your bunt defenses? He goes, get it out. Like that, mm-hmm. that, he's like, that's, it. Mm-hmm. that's just, yeah. it. let's just, why are we overcomplicating something there that we just need? That's to, right. Uh, well, you know, and, and simplicity allows for consistency too, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's that old proverb, you know, you'd rather, you, you don't want to face the guy that's practiced one punch a thousand times. You'd rather the guy that's tried practiced a thousand punches one time, right? So mm-hmm. there's something about that simplicity, especially, and you you brought it up earlier, Monty. I mean, and it's and it is a great, great point and observation. The game is difficult enough. Why mm-hmm. why am I as a coach gonna make things more complex and more difficult for you? Um, especially given your philosophy of the game is yours. Practice is mine. The game is yours. Man, I, I can't make things complicated if I'm going to hand it over and not micromanage a game. I got to let mm-hmm. you rip, man. So that's, I, mm-hmm. I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I really, really like that approach for sure. So, so Monty, let me ask you this in the last uh, little bit of time we have here. You've been, doing this now for over 20 some years and you've Mm -hmm. even in that 20 some years, uh, you know, amassed over 500 victories. I mean, just like I say, really a big fan of what you've done at every program you've been to and the listeners Mm -hmm. heard that in the introduction. Um, what do you think we're doing well in college baseball now? And, and maybe what, what do you think if we, 
could still uh, improve uh, as we look at the game today? Ooh. Um, You're like, do we well, have another I, hour? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll, I'll try to keep this answer as short as I can um, because it's, it's a pretty broad question. Um, as far as what we're doing well, here, here's what I'll, here's what I'll say. This was from, the, I, I had a scouting director. Okay. Not a scout, a scouting director. Okay. For an organization. Uh, I was up in the Cape, uh, earlier this summer looking at some guys that were in a transfer portal and I was eating in a restaurant and this scouting director walked by and he said, you know, he said, I just left the SEC tournament and went and watched our double A team play for a week. He said, in this day and age, he goes, the SEC looks like double A and double A looks like high A. Wow. And he said, five years ago, the SEC looked like high A and double A looked like double A. So he said, the game is so physical now. The players are so physical. Guys are throwing so hard, hitting the ball so hard. Um, So, I would say that as far as kind of what we're doing well, I think, again, um, look, the, 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 the evolution of athletes has never went backwards, right? Yeah. Right. This never went backwards. So the players are getting better and better and better and better and will continue to do so. Even though we don't think it's humanly possible, they're going to continue to get better. So as far as kind of what we're doing well, I think that there's there's so much good information out there now and kids are training at such a high level that they're really pushing the envelope year in and year out at the level of performance. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as things that I think we could do better, um, and this is probably more of the old school side of me, um, I, I, I wish that there were more strikes being thrown. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that like when you watch the game in this day and age, like it's very hard because of travel ball and the tournament cycles and the showcases, kids are only throwing two or three innings, you know, every time they run out there and pitch, like they're not having to deal with pitching with runners on base and pitching out of situations and those kind of things. So I think it's harder than ever to develop starting pitching. Um, um, and, um, and and you just see that kind of across the board, whether it's in high school baseball, college baseball. Um, I I think another thing that we're doing really well that I hope high school baseball implements is the pitch clock. I think the speed of the game, man, is so much better at the college level. And you know, when we go and watch high school games now, it's like, oh my god, like That's these like games are so <laughs> slow. So like, I think they need to implement what we're doing in professional baseball, what we're doing in college baseball, as far as the pitch clock to speed the game up. That's something that we can do a better job of. Um, but look, kids, kids are running faster. Defensive ability is through the roof. Um, I wish there were more pure hitters, just like pure hitters. I think you see a lot of guys that can play in the middle of the field and can run and defend and, and hit for power, but just pure hit tool It's hard to find guys that are pure hitters and pure strike throwers. Yeah. Um, So, you know, just again, like if there's anything you'd like to see a little bit more out of the game at the, at the younger levels, it's just letting guys, you know, the kids that can hit, just let them hit. Don't overcoach them. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes there's a lot of kids that are good hitters that it's coached out of them because they go to too many different, you know, hitting gurus, so to speak. Um, and just emphasizing uh, command over velocity at a young age, you know, let the let velocity develop naturally because it will. Um, and th- those are the things that I think we could do a better job of overall. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with with those assessments. So today you and I were texting. This is the last question I have for you. You and I were texting and uh, talking a little bit about some of the topics uh, for tonight. And, you know, you were like, hey, I've, I've done this a while. I'm, I'm you know, open book, you can talk about whatever you want. I, I am curious, and this is a question I've been asking a lot of our guests lately, is it's the old, like, you know, knowing what you know now, if you could go back and, and you know, give yourself some advice. But I'm a little bit more specific about this. I'd like to know what age, like, where where are you in your evolution that you would want to go back and talk to yourself, and then what advice you'd be giving yourself? Who? Um, 
you know, if there's if there's if there's one thing that if I could go back and tell my younger self, um, I would I would say um, because I was a head coach at such a young age, I was a head coach at 31 years old. Um, so I, I had I had 14 years where when it came to computer skills and technology and and all of that, even though like I'm really a growth mindset guy when it comes to looking at data, technology, analytics, all of that. But as far as like being able to cut a computer on and delve into that information or or spit that information out, I'm not I'm not great on a computer. I wish my computer skills were better because I see the younger coaches in this day and age who have tremendous computer skills of being able to look into all those data points and spit out information. I wish that I had that skill set. Um, being now, I guess, a, a little bit more of an old school guy in that regard, uh, even though I do read it, understand it, and love it. Uh, but being able, like, for me to, if someone wanted me to be a director of player development, I'd be like, I got no shot at doing that. <laughs> like, I can't. I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a coach in regards know to thyself, communication. Right? Yeah. Know thyself. <laughs> I'm, right. That is not that is not my strength. I wish that I would have developed uh, more of a skill set there. Um, and one of the things that I would say too is, you know, you you one of the things that I have learned over the years too is people always say like you'd rather work smart than work hard, right? Like it's better to work smart than work hard, and, and that's so foolish to say, because you don't learn how to work smart until you've worked hard. It's like, you, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't learn how to be, you don't learn this or whatever it is you choose to do in life. You don't learn how to work smart until you've worked hard and started to figure out the system to make it a little bit easier on yourself Mm -hmm. over years of trial and error. Yeah. So it's like you have to go through the trial and error and the working 16 hours a day to start to figure out, okay, now I have a much better grasp of how to do this smarter than harder. Uh, So if there's anything that I would tell any young coach, it's like, don't look for the cheat code. Right. You know, don't look for don't look for the easy way, you know, the smart way to do it. Like roll your freaking sleeves up and go to work and you know, that self-exploration and, and hard work that you have to do when you don't know all the answers, I think pays dividends for you later on. It's funny you say that because Brandon's heard me tell this story and coming on the heels of the question I just asked you, I heard Anson Dorrance, the longtime UNC women's soccer coach uh, on a podcast one time and somebody asked him, what would you go tell yourself if you could go back in time? And he said, not a damn thing. He said, yeah, that's true. He said, you know, there with that struggle with that, you know, like you said, don't look for the cheat code with, with that struggle comes all that. Well, Monty, listen, I got to tell you, you know, every program has their brotherhood and college of Charleston is, you know, we're all connected with having played there. We're, you know, awfully proud of you, awfully proud of Fox Hall, Oliver. I mean, all you guys that have gone on and represented our program uh, so well, but we we've been pulling for you and we're happy that we had a chance to have you on the show. Well, thank you very much. It's been, it's been a pleasure to be on here with you guys. And uh, again, just, just appreciate it. Appreciate all you do for the game. Appreciate you. you, Good luck this season. We'll talk with you all soon. All right. Take care. Thanks. Want to provide feedback or stay up to date with the show? Visit our Instagram page at Mental Advantage Podcast. Or you can send us an email at podcast at mentaladvantage.net. To have John Cullen work with you or your team, please write to him at john.cullen at mentaladvantage.net. Thanks for listening to today's episode.